calling everybody one by one. And you can send me a chat message if you don't want me to call on you or if you want me to read a question from the chat, I'll do that also. And um, does anyone need to go first? You can raise your hand or raise a little um, reaction button. If Gail, you want to go first? You can unmute yourself. Yes, I want to ask Eric, how, do, how does he save, how does he help in our families? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, Romans 8.26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. So, but basically, our infirmities there is that we know not what we should pray for as we ought. And so Christ is uh, having these groanings to the Father to help us to overcome those infirmities. And the way we overcome our infirmity of not knowing how to pray for what we should pray for as we ought is by getting the doctrine in the inner man and then pray. You notice he says that in Romans 8, we don't know what we should pray for. But when you get to Ephesians later on in the epistles there, He'll say in Ephesians 1, he prays. Ephesians 3, he prays. So um, the more doctrine you get in your inner man, then the more you, um, then you know how to pray. And But how specifically does the Spirit of Christ help our infirmities? I think it's more in line with uh, what happened to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, where he says, that uh, in verse 7, that there was a thorn in the flesh, messenger of Satan to buffet him. And he asked the Lord three times for that thorn in the flesh to depart him. And in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. So the principle there is, the weaker my flesh is, the more I rely upon the Spirit. And so the way I take Romans 8.26, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities, is helping by increasing the difficulties that we have in the flesh in order so that we will be weak in the flesh, so that we will concentrate on the spiritual. And then then we will know, then we'll get into the doctrine and pray. That's how I take it. That may not be correct. But um, that's how I see it. Because if, if he did that with Paul, a messenger of Satan is sent to buffet him and, the, and a thorn in the flesh, and the result is that Christ's strength is made perfect in weakness, then my view is that God, and I don't know exactly how, it does, how this happens, but God somehow would increase our infirmities in the flesh so that we trust in the strength of Christ coming through our spirit rather than in our flesh because then our flesh is weak at that time. So that anyway, that's that's how I look at it. So you think that uh, he gives us all a thorn in the flesh so we won't be all puffed up with knowledge? I, well, you notice in 2 Corinthians 12, 7, it says it was a messenger of Satan to buffet him. When uh, Satan came and presented himself to God in Job chapter 1, um, God says, well, have you considered my servant Job? And he allows Satan to buffet Job with some trials. So now that is more in line with what you would find in Israel's program than what we have in the, in the body of Christ. So that's why I hesitate to say it works exactly like that, but that's how it worked for Paul. So I think that is, that is a possibility. I don't think... God strikes us with anything, you know, but it's rather a uh, God, yeah, but rather God allowing Satan to bring a thorn in our flesh so that we don't get puffed up and that we rely upon Christ in us rather than in our flesh. That, to me, that means you need to keep you humble. Yes. Instead of being proud. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, I try to word it carefully because I know people will say, well, you know, God struck you with, this disease or God's I don't think I don't think that's what it is it's basically like you say 
God keeping you humble so that you don't, you know, you're not going, in other words, um, I don't think anybody who is living the Christ life, having Christ live in them is going to be a very powerful person in this world. I don't think you'll have somebody who is very rich in this world. Uh, I think that there is the, that God would have those messenger of Satan to keep us from getting a lot of money or a lot of power and uh, keep us from, you know, being big celebrities and well-known uh, just so we, so like you say, it keeps us humble. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's how I would take it. Thank you. Good answer. <laughs> Thanks, Gail. Yeah, that's, that's a tough one. <laughs> Hello, thank you. Um, Arnie and Liz, I want to go next. I see your hands up. Uh, Eric, you've seen the, the example of... Can, can you get a little closer to the mic, Liz? I, I can barely hear you. Is that better? A little bit. I think, it, I think it's hooked up on the computer instead. Um, Liz, bring it. Bring the computer closer to you. How's that? Yeah, that's getting better as you get closer to the computer. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you a lot better now. Yeah, go ahead. What was that verse that you were giving an example of you and Lana personally about watching you? For example, you watched wanted to watch football. She wanted to watch something else. But what was that verse, that example, in reference to which verse? That's what I meant. Oh, um, that was in reference to uh, John eight twenty nine. Okay, that's all I needed to know. I, yeah, I, let me read it just to make sure I got that right. Yeah, John eight twenty nine. Jesus says, uh, "I do always those things that please the Father." Okay. And so I was trying to demonstrate that. It's not like me wanting Lana to watch the football game because that will please me. Because the Father is love, it's a very uh, unselfish thing to want to please the Father. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks, Liz. Does anyone else need to go next? If not, Clint, do you want to go next? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, appreciate folks pray for an individual that's coming to our Bible class. Uh, he uh, is not professed Christ as his Savior yet. He's having cancer operation on the 13th of this month. So uh, I think God's been working in his heart to at least get him to come to the classes. So I'm pleased with that. So I, I certainly appreciate Derek's class, and especially on this comments about the faith of Christ, that's obviously very important, and it's not really uh, seen or understood by lots of people, and certainly the corrupt versions take it out. So anytime something's left out, and it's in the King James Bible, that means it must be mighty, mighty important. So, yeah. so, so thank you very much, uh, Eric. Yeah, that's a good, important, uh, good, good uh, comment, that uh, whenever they take something out, of your King James Bible in these modern versions. That's something you really want to pay attention to. Yeah. Thanks, Clint. Clint, what is the name of the man that you want us to pray for? Rick. 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 Has he been consistently coming to your classes? Uh, he's a person that, uh, that he and I have worked together for several years, and I've talked to him on many occasions. He, he and I have traveled some together. He's always said he wants his neighbor to be a Christian, but he wasn't interested, and he it doesn't have any confidence in it. He's uh, unfortunately a very, very intellectual person. He has a doctor's degree, very smart. And sometimes these folks are a little bit more difficult to get to, and so, so we always wondered about well, what class should we have? What should we go over? And of course, we always go back to Romans one sixteen. For the gospel of Christ is the power of God. So that's what we try to, to emphasize uh, regularly. So uh, uh, so God is obviously working in, in his heart, and all things work together for, for them to love the Lord. So him having possibly cancer has uh, got him to thinking at least. So that's, that's real good. His name is Rick. So thank you very much. Okay. 
How about I say a, a prayer for him? Yeah, I think that's that'd be great. Yeah. Okay, Father, um, we come before you, and we are so grateful for your life that you chose to send Jesus to die for us, so that we can have life in and through you. And Father, we do pray for this man, Rick. We are grateful for Clint and Linda and Alan that their home is open to speak the truth of the gospel of Christ today, and we do pray that Rick will be there more and continue to hear and that his spiritual eyes will be open to truth. Father, I pray that Rick will understand that his sin separates him from you, and that you've made it all right. You've done it all for us to have life with you, life in you, life through you. I pray for this young man to realize he could be facing eternity, and Lord, let, let him realize that that you are a very real God, a very loving Father, that you've done everything for him to have a relationship with you. Thank you that Clint and Linda and Alan are in his life to proclaim truth and love. We pray for Rick to understand his need of salvation and to believe, to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ for today. And we pray this in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Okay, Clint. Um, Richard, do you want to go next? Yeah, I, I want to ask, what do you, I don't know if you know enough about universalism to answer this question, but what do those people do with the great white throne judgment? If they believe that everybody is saved, I think that's what they teach. Right. And they teach eternal security. What do they do with the great white throne judgment? I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I don't know enough about it. That's a, that's a very good question. I mean, you you see there at the Great White Throne Judgment that all those people are cast into hell. Yeah. It may be. I think. I think I've heard now thinking about. I think I've heard somebody say, like it says, um, Romans. I'm sorry, Revelation twenty, and verse fourteen. It says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. I think I've heard somebody say, a universal salvation person say that, well, what that means is that death, if death and hell are cast into the lake of fire, then uh, they're done away with. Death and hell are destroyed in the lake of fire, and so no one is in, in hell because it's destroyed. I, I think... I think that's, that's like what they say. I, th I think that's what they say on that one. Yeah, but, but you know, the very next verse says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So that shows you that they're part of death and hell, and so they get cast into the lake of fire with it. But I think their explanation is that, uh, that basically death and hell are destroyed by being cast into the lake of fire, therefore everybody is saved. Wow, like internal combustion or something. I mean, it's, they, they just burn themselves up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, well, there's other other verses too you can bring on with that. But is there another church that teaches eternal, true eternal security other than right division and universalism? I, I mean, I've I, I, I well. heard of a lot of churches not. And I've heard churches teach eternal security, but I mean true eternal security. Where, you know. not, not really. I mean, the, the Calvinists say that, you, you know, there's the eternal security. There's the perseverance of the saints. And so that's where, like the Baptists, for example, usually in a Baptist statement of faith, it'll say they teach eternal security. But then they'll say, well, if you don't continue in serving God, then you didn't really have true saving faith. So they believe in the doctrine of Calvinism, which is perseverance of the saints. But then if you didn't have the works to follow it, then you're not really a saint, is how they explain it. So, so yeah, in, in, their, in their mind, they're saying that they teach eternal security, that if you are a saint, if you are predestinated by God to go to heaven, then you are a saint, and so then you will persevere, so you are eternally secure. But they get around it by saying, if you don't follow what they say, then uh, you weren't really a saint. You just thought you were a saint, you really weren't. 
So they won't say you lost your salvation. They just say you never were saved because you never, you never truly believed because you didn't have the works. So, uh, yeah, I don't think, you know, to me, that's just a cop out. That's <laughs> so, yeah, they don't really, I, I don't, I don't know of any other church that teaches eternal security. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. I mean, truly eternal security. I mean, yeah, all they're doing is is they're just you know denying their sin. They're not they're not facing up to their you know fluctuation between believing and not believing. They're not. They just don't face reality. Yeah. Uh, so, but, uh, but other than I, I don't think. I mean, I've never heard of any other church that teaches you know real pure, true eternal security. Like right division, I you know there's really not out there that I've heard of. I mean, universalism, I thought they would, you know, because they believe everybody's saved and nobody's going to hell. <laughs> yeah. So that would be, you know, eternal security, but you know, in, in a perverted way or something. <laughs> there, there, there's, right. there's no saving faith of Jesus Christ in that. So. Yeah, anyhow, thank you for that answer. Yeah, uh, religion is based upon money and power, and it's hard for them to get those when they give away the power by saying that you can't lose your salvation. It's like they don't have control over you. They don't have power over you, so then they can't get your money. Uh, at least they, won't, they can't force you to give. So, uh, yeah, I think that's why churches don't teach eternal security, true eternal security. They can't guilt you into giving. They can't guilt you into staying a member. They can't guilt you into, you know, towing the line or guilt you into being under condemnation. They guilt you into that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> it's a whole guilt trip they put on you. Mm -hmm. you know, and they just, they, and, and they deny it. They, you know, they deny they're doing sins too, and they just don't. Anyhow, anyhow thank you yeah. for the answer. Uh -huh. Hey Scotty, do you have a question? And then I'll and then I'll call on you, Oscar. Hey Scotty. I actually have a comment um, what uh, Eric was saying. I was raised up uh, someone in the Baptist church and they do teach eternal salvation, but then again, you can never do enough work to satisfy the church. They always want more and more and more. And like you say, if you aren't working in the church, you're not saved. You just you are. And also, I had a professor that was a universalist, and he was quite proud of that fact, and uh, said that it was like it wasn't like any church I that any of us had ever been to. But they are also very welcoming of um, homosexuality as well. According to him, I don't know, but anyway. Yeah, I've heard that about. There's a universal church not too far from where I am, and I've heard that about that church as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oscar, you, you, did you raise your hand, Oscar? Yeah. Oh, no. Thank you for that. Well, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, um, I can hear you. Yeah, oh. I think I froze up for a minute. Thank, thank you again, Brother Eric. That was interesting. And um, so I'm, I'm reading Galatians 2.16. Know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. So I'm looking for a parallel to that verse. Would Romans 5.1 uh, be a parallel instead? Because it says, therefore, being justified. Could you, uh, I mean, I know the word says justified by faith, but uh, could that also be uh, putting in that uh, justified by by faith by the faith of Jesus also there in Romans five one? Yeah, it doesn't say that there, but that that's why I turned to Galatians two sixteen. Correct. Because Galatians two sixteen says we're justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. Romans five one just says we're justified by faith. But comparing Correct. verse by verse, then we must be justified by the faith of Jesus Christ. So yeah. on my side notes, I can put, uh, therefore being justified by, uh, by faith, and then I put of Christ. 
we have peace with God. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's good to recognize that. Yeah, and, there, okay. and your cross yeah. reference would be Galatians two sixteen. Yeah. Yeah, I wrote that in reference. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, that's why I was making sure that I understood yeah. you correctly. But right. Yeah, because you know, because people will think that they have. That's the, a good point because most people who are of as babes may may not understand that they think it's their faith, and obviously our faith uh, wavers and doubts and fears and doubts and wavers at times. Whereas uh, Christ's faith never wavers. So, um, okay. I just wanted to make sure I had the right reference and that um, I understood that correctly. And that uh, the reference was going to be on uh, Galatians 2.16. Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, over there in 2 Timothy 2 also uh, in verse 13. 2 Timothy 2.13. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good verse to go along with that. You know, talking about how people think it's their faith. Well, 2 Timothy 2.13 says, if we believe not. So we basically lose the faith. We stop trusting. It says, well, yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. So that would be good for Romans, justification at Romans 5.1. Yeah, I think that's a good cross-reference there as well, yeah. So oh, we're justified right. by the faith of Christ. And if we decide later on we're not going to believe in Christ then uh, we still have salvation because Christ abideth faithful. We are justified by His faith, not our faith. And since He abideth faithful, then we uh, still have our salvation. Uh, and then also Galatians 2.16 is another reference. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Two references for Romans 5.1. Thank you. Uh -huh. Page 30. Sharon, do you have a question or comment? Hi, Sharon. Can you hear us okay? It's in the bottom left. The microphone. Yeah, I found it. Yeah, it hey. took me a while. I was tapping on it, but nothing was happening. Uh, no, I don't really have a question. Um, I just want to say hi to everybody and um, thank you to Eric. And um, that's about it. All right, Sharon. Well, glad you could join us tonight. I just appreciate you, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. And we say hello back, Sharon. I'm so glad you're with us. And uh, what not Catherine, you're welcome. You're welcome. And Catherine, do you have a question or comment? Hey, well, I enjoyed the study. I was just listening. I was actually trying to find in my notes from a previous um, session, but I can't find it, but it sort of applies to a question you had earlier. Well, it's about the thorn in the side. I believe Gail asked it, and I've been thinking about that. I've heard some teachings that explain that that thorn is actually that thorn uh, messenger of Satan is exactly what it says. And it's an actual human being that probably kept accusing Paul and causing him to doubt, or trying to cause him to doubt. And um, I'll just share that this weekend, Thursday, after my last teaching, my last class, I had to rush to the airport, fly to Tucson, and spending the weekend with my sister who lives there. And... Um, Oscar already heard this because I shared it with our Monday night group. I'll be in the house of Pharisees, and I'm kind of getting sick to my stomach about it because um, this person has been a thorn in my flesh, but I love her dearly. She is my sister, and we get together and we laugh a lot, but I have to, I'm, I'll be in her house, and she has done me great harm, and God has been so gracious over the past few years, that I do love her. Of course, I forgive her because that's what we do in Christ. And I love her very much, but it will be very hard. But anyway, um, I can't find my references about that, but I believe that is a person, accusing person, that was a thorn in Paul's flesh. And then there are three times, if you remember, Eric, I know you know this, at first, in one of the early epistles, Paul calls himself the least of all saints. And then the next time he says, I'm less than the least of the saints. 
And then the next time, after he suffered so much, but experienced so much grace, he says, I'm the chief of sinners. So right. it is like, it is, it's not like God's making you be humble, but the more you experience grace, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, it, it's just hard. So I do appreciate, appreciate prayers for me this weekend. When I have to, I have to be fun and be kind and be gracious. And I told my sister, I want to be grace this weekend. I just want to be grace. So, all right, that's, that's it. But my other sister will be there too, and, and we get along wonderfully. So it'll be fun. You know, I have to fly around at the pool and go to parties and be at their big mansion. And He's a preacher of a big church, her husband. So I'm definitely going to be in the home of Pharisees. So, appreciate your prayers. Now, I understand. You, you don't need to apologize for that, Catherine. Um, okay. Personally, um, I, I think the context of 2 Corinthians 12 is that it was some kind of physical ailment. But, um, but what you're saying, um, I think that is still true. That uh, Satan will use anything he can to try to keep us from being in grace. I, and mainly what I've noticed in my, my experience is that he'll use other Christians. Because most yeah. Christians, um, they know, you know God's word somewhat, but they don't rightly divide and they don't understand grace. They're... They're under a, a works or a law-based type of system. And it, it's just interesting, you know, as you go through life, it seems like as you as you grow in grace, you'll see those, you know, every once in a while someone, you know, in, the, in that Christian circle crop up. And it's like, you can tell it, you know, when you when you rightly divide and you understand and you're growing in that doctrine, you can, you can tell that, you know, this seems like, you know, it's, it's awfully funny how this is timed, you know, where I'm just starting to grow in this that now it's like a a messenger of satan here to cause me to doubt what i'm believing in paul's epistles and trying to bring me back into the legalism of churchianity so it, it does seem like that's the case i know when um job you know you look at him all his family uh is killed except for his wife well why is his wife sticking around well she's her famous line in the in the Bible is "Curse God and die." So I mean, you know, yeah. Satan allows Satan had control. He could have killed all of them, but he decides to keep the wife around and keep her around to be a basically a messenger of Satan to buffet Job to tell him stop trusting in God, just curse him, and then go to your grave. <laughs> so right. so I mean, I I I don't think the context of Second Corinthians twelve is talking about that, but what you're saying. Is, is definitely true. That there will be people, it seems like, uh, that come into your life uh, at these certain times when you're, when you're really growing and it's like they're trying to, it's like Satan sends that person to sort of bring you back into, into churchianity. You know, over in, that was 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 11 mentions that uh, it talks about uh, Satan has transformed himself into an angel of light. At 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, and verse uh, thirteen says talks about false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, and then in verse fifteen it says that these people are uh, they've they're ministers of Satan who have transformed themselves as the ministers of righteousness. Yes. So you've got scriptural support there that shows that um, Satan basically has people who are his ministers, but they look like ministers of righteousness. So it's usually churchianity or that community that's doing that. You know, yes, like, and, and when you love the people, it's very hard. You don't even know if they're in Christ or not. You know. Yeah. But, so. Yes, yeah, and is, it's. Thank you. Yeah, and it's it's a very delicate situation. It's hard to do, especially yeah. if it's family. You know, because yes. it's not it's not like somebody you know. You, meet on the street that you won't see again, you know, you're going to have interactions with them the rest of your life probably. So, 
Well, I tried that for a few years, just really kind of breaking off relationship, but I, I couldn't, you know, mm -hmm. I couldn't. So, anyway, yeah, that's good. So, thank you. And that's coming up this weekend, is that? Yes, right? yes, yes. I mean, it'll be fun. I don't know why in the world I got upset just then. I was just thinking about it. It'll be fun. And I'm just going to be grace, and I'm going to try to keep my mouth shut about religious issues or spiritual issues. We'll, we'll have fun. So, anyway, thank you. Is it okay if I say a prayer for you? Oh, well, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, I'll be visiting my sister Marissa and John in Tucson, and my other uh, sweet baby sister Frances will be there too. Dear Lord, we thank you for Catherine. We thank you for her growing in grace and the time that she's spending your word, learning right division and learning the doctrine for today. And in a world that uh, doesn't trust in you and those who say they trust in you don't believe your word. And now she's in a situation here this weekend with family members who you know, have that Christian, that form of godliness, whether they actually are saved, she doesn't know, but uh, at least having that form. And Lord, we know how difficult that is, a situation can be. Think of Paul when he was persecuted mostly from, from religion, people who said they were following God, not really from the pagans so much, but from the religion. Jesus, the same way, persecuted by the Pharisees, not so much by the Romans. And so, uh, Lord, we know this is a difficult situation, but we know that uh, you promise in your word that God always causes us to triumph in Christ. And so we pray that you will help Catherine to allow Christ to live in her, living by the faith of the Son of God, that, uh, that she would just show grace, that she would show God's love, and uh, if there is an opportunity that she would have to share what she's learned and how she's grown in grace, that you will uh, give her that wisdom to share, but if not, uh, just help her just to show God's love to them and that maybe it will soften their hearts in the future and see that... Uh, that your word effectually worketh in those that believe. It's not some kind of religious show. It's not some kind of thing that we're trying to make, make ourselves look good, but it's just uh, Christ living through us, presenting our bodies as a living sacrifice, and then you do all the work and you share your love through us. So help Catherine to share God's love, live by your faith, and be that Christ example to her family. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome, Catherine. It's uh, yeah, I can, I can understand that. So. Oscar asked if he could add something to that, and then we'll then I'll go to Philippe and then Gail. So, Oscar, you wanted to say something? Uh, Catherine mentioned that she did. Uh, she had has the scriptures uh, right offhand about the thorns, and uh, I went I went and looked them up, and uh, it's in Numbers 33.55. That's Numbers 33.55, and it says, But if ye will not drive off the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come to pass that those which ye let remain of them shall be pricks in your eyes and thorns in your sides, and shall vex you in the land wherein ye dwell. Joshua twenty three thirteen. Hmm. No, Joshua twenty three thirteen. Know for a certainty that the Lord your God will no more drive out any of these nations from before you, but they shall be snares and traps unto you, and scourges in your sides, and thorns in your eyes, until you perish from off this good land which the Lord your God has given you. And now I understand we're talking to Israel because of their disobedience. So don't take that personal. Yeah. I also said I will not drive them out from before you. Judges 2, 3. Judges 2, 3. Wherefore I also said I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare unto you. So I went through them. Um, uh, yeah, I had given you those three, uh, those references. Yeah, because thorns in the sides, I believe, is like, so I personally believe they are, um, false doctrines talk or people who bring in false doctrines that can be a snare so uh, and that mm. personally I believe that may have uh, been a big problem 
for Paul as he would walk around these cities and towns. I, he probably looked for some individuals knowing that they were going to come to him because of his uh, of grace message. And, you know, but I, I just want to say, because they were a thorn on his side because they, they worshipped other gods and they worshipped the gods of Diana and he had all them problems in the book of Acts when he was um, urged. So, you know, this is Corinthians, but uh, he doesn't ever mention it again. So uh, God's grace is sufficient, Catherine, and if that helps, yeah. that's probably the best answer that we can get from God's uh, power is his grace is sufficient. So I hope yeah. that. Amen. All right. Mm -hmm. That's what I had to add. Yeah, thank you, Oscar, for sharing those verses. It's good. Boyd, did you want to say something too? Um, yeah, it was just two things. Uh, first of all, to um, I just want to say something to Catherine. Yeah, it is hard. Um, like my father's not saved, and you know, about I don't know how long ago it was, but I eventually got tired of running, you know, sort of being around the bush. So I just basically came out and just told him that you know he was going to hell and all that, and oh. he didn't believe in Jesus. He was, you know, his destiny was hell, and that ended me with. A tongue lashing, he kicked me out, kicked my wife out, mm. and within two minutes we're on the street and the door was slammed in our face. And, you know, I went home crying and, you know, it took me about a year to reconcile with my dad. But I guess what I've come to realize is that it's, it's, my dad doesn't reject me because, like, his son, he loves me, he rejects God, he rejects the truth. So it's not a personal thing that, you know, with family, because they do love you, what they reject is the, the truth of. The Bible, the truth of the gospel, and um, yeah, and they still love you. They just can't handle the truth. So it's hard to get rejected, but you know. But then I also thought how Christ was rejected by, you know, um, when he came, he was also rejected. So you know, um, I guess yeah. it's just it's part of the territory. I think. I mean, yeah, and that's exactly right. Not personal. It's exactly right. Yeah. yeah. And um, and the other thing was, um, it's just a question for Eric. Um, I've been doing a Bible study on why Christ was baptized, and we know that he was baptized to fulfill our righteousness. But I just want to ask, um, could I possibly go down the wrong the wrong road here? But that's why I'm asking. Was we know that Jesus is going to be um, a king of priests and going to be a, a priest after the order of Melchizedek? Could it also be possible that? He also was baptized in order to fulfill the legal requirements of the priesthood, like to be washed. Um, uh, he had to be 30 years old, which he was. Um, he, uh, you know, there had to be sprinkling of blood, but he sprinkled his own blood, etc. Is that like, is that is that possible, or am I going down a wrong track here? Well, it seems like what happens at the water baptism is that. You've got the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove. And then the very next chapter, Matthew 4, the Spirit leads him to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Uh, it seems like it's at that time at the water baptism is when he is uh, given the Holy Spirit. And Exodus 29, in the, under the Levitical priesthood, they are to be washed with water and they're also to be anointed with oil. And the, and the anointing with oil is a type of the Holy Ghost. When you see the uh, disciples or uh, anybody who was members of the little flock during that ad had phase of the kingdom, they were going to John or they were going to Jesus. They were getting water baptized. And then, Acts 2, they received the Holy Ghost. So it seems like um, the, the water baptism was, and from Acts 2, 38, when Peter says, Repent and be baptized for their mission of sins couple verse later he says save yourselves from this untoward generation it seemed that the water baptism at that time anyway mainly was done uh yeah they're going to be a kingdom of priests but i think it was mainly to show that that they have separated themselves out from the apostate nation and they're they're part of god and as a result then god is going to give them the holy ghost and then the holy ghost will minister through them with the miracles that were done you know the miracles they would do and everything to get the lost sheep of the house of Israel to be saved. So I think when Jesus says, suffer it to be so now as to fulfill all righteousness, I think it's saying that basically 
at that phase, at the at hand phase of the kingdom, God is separating out the believing remnant of Israel from the apostate nation. And he does that through when you uh, believe the gospel of the kingdom, then you are to be water baptized, and then you would receive the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost would give you the power to do all those miracles and preach the gospel and give you the words to say, speaking in tongues, those types of things, in order to get the lost sheep of the house of Israel to be saved. So I think the reason that Jesus was water baptized, it was just like that was the start of that. Like, uh, that you know, like Jesus says, or well, John the Baptist says, why, why do you need to be water baptized? I'm the one that needs to be baptized by you. Well, you know, you're the son of God. You're the one that takes away the sin of the world. I think when he says suffer to be so now is to fulfill all righteousness, I think it was, that was the, basically the two-step plan in order for the believing remnant of Israel to be separated from the apostate nation. And so I think Jesus was water baptized so that he would be shown to be separated from the apostate nation and then he received the Holy Ghost so he would, um, you know, try to get the lost sheep of the house of Israel saved. That That's... That's really how I see it. I don't think it's really... I mean, it is part of that Levitical priest ceremony thing, but I think in the kingdom of priests, but mainly I think it's just because God is separating out the, uh, the believing remnant. And the Holy Ghost is given as the power for him to... Because he was there to... He could forget. You know, a lot of people think he did that as God, but he really did it as man. He says the Son of Man forgives sins. The Son of Man did those healings. Um, and then the, the disciples, they would do the same thing. They were able to cast out devils and uh, do miracles. And John 20, he says, uh, you, you're able to remit sins or to retain sins. It's the same power that they had. So I think it was all part of that. This is how I separate, God is separating out the little flock and giving them the power of miracles and giving them the Holy Ghost so that they could then reach the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And I think Jesus was the start of that. And I think that's that's really why that took place. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, Eric. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Philippe. Good to see you today. Good to see you. Bye. just talking about the reason why he also was he doing that to fulfill the law he came to fulfill the law and that was part of the law yeah when he says suffer to fulfill all righteousness I mean he is I think part of that is Exodus 29 the Levitical priesthood I mean he is it says that you should wash him in water and that you should anoint him with oil so, yeah, that's that's part of it, yeah. Okay, and another thing with Catherine, Catherine was saying, I'm going to go through a same situation next week. Oh. I'm going to visit my daughter, who is totally Catholic. Oh. And that's going to be a, a tough one, too. Okay. Yeah, I just leave my hand, my life in his hands. <clears throat> that's all right. That's it. That's all we can do. Yeah. That's it. Thank you. Well, thanks, Gail. Yeah, we'll have to... Can I say a quick prayer for you, too, as well? Yes, please. All right. Dear Lord, we thank you for Gail. We thank you for the sweet member of the body of Christ that you've made her out to be. And uh, we pray that you will just help her as she's going to be with her daughter and the, and the, and her Catholic religion lord we know that that's that satan has such a strong hold over people through that religion i know just even through my dad having to with him going to catholic seminary and lord i just know what a difficult thing it is to deal with something like that it's uh it's like they won't even listen to that they're not even interested in the truth because they're so steeped in that religion and so i pray that you will just uh, help gail just like with catherine to show god's <clears throat> grace to live by the faith of Christ and that you would soften the heart of her daughter, her daughter that she would at least be open to hearing the truth and uh, having the Holy Ghost draw her to himself. Um, 
that she may be willing to listen to the gospel. And Lord, just give Gail the wisdom to know what to say, know what to do. Maybe maybe she doesn't need to share any of that. Maybe her daughter isn't willing. I don't know. But uh, just give Gail the wisdom, just to, may, mainly just to show God's love, Christ's love to, to her daughter, and uh, that that may, uh, that may change her mind and she may be open to the truth. Maybe planting a little seed, maybe a little later she'll be able to Listen to the gospel. I don't know, Lord. You you know the situation. So just uh, give Gail the wisdom. Should help her to show Christ's love to her daughter and that her daughter may receive those things. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you. Thanks, Gail, for sharing that. I want to say hi to Jason. And he uh, he has a question. We're so grateful you're joining us tonight. Okay. Uh, hi. Go ahead. Hi, Jason. Okay. Hello. Um, you can hear me good, okay, right? Yes, loud and clear, yes. Okay. Oh, okay, cool. Um, yeah, I had a question about uh, Colossians 2, verse 11, about how we're circumcised from, uh, our flesh is circumcised from our, our soul. Um I think it was earlier today or maybe yesterday you were teaching, you were talking a lot about that. Um, I understand the, the flesh, uh, if, it, if we sin, it won't contaminate our, our soul um, after we're saved. Um, but I know a lot of sins that we commit, we commit it in, within our soul. Our body, I guess our fleshly body is not involved in that. So how, how does, um, since the analogy of our flesh not getting, not contaminating our soul, if we sin within our soul, how does that not contaminate our soul? Is, I guess is what I'm trying to ask. <laughs> well, it's really your flesh that does it. You've got, um, you're a three-part being. Your soul, you can think of sort of as your mind. That's where you make your decisions. And then your flesh... Romans 7, 18 says, In your flesh dwells no good thing. Uh, Philippians 3 says that uh, we have vile flesh. Uh, so sin is resident in our flesh. The sin nature works with the flesh, and all the flesh can do is sin. There's no capacity to not sin according to the flesh. But once you believe the gospel, uh, your spirit, which was dead in trespasses and sins, is made alive in Christ. And so now your soul is your mind. That's sort of in the middle there. And so what your soul does is it can either listen to your flesh, which is where your sin nature is and where there's nothing good in your flesh, or it can listen to your spirit, which is um, alive in Christ. And then the Holy Spirit teaches your spirit the things of God as you read and believe God's Word. So then you can decide to follow the, the Spirit of Christ through your spirit, or you can decide to follow your flesh. So really, uh, that the soul doesn't really have... I mean, before you're saved, before you're spiritually circumcised, your, your sin really resides in your flesh, but because it's all connected, then the sins from your flesh get to your soul. And so the sin is on your soul there. But once you're saved... You have the putting off of the body the sins of the flesh. The flesh is circumcised from the soul. So that uh, if you do sin, it's not really your soul that sins. It's just your flesh that does that. You decide with your fleshly mind to listen to your flesh. And so the, the sin still is in your flesh. It still resides in your flesh. The sin doesn't really reside in the soul. The sin, the sin goes to your soul if you haven't been saved. But if you've got the spiritual circumcision then it's not your soul that sins, it's really, it's your, the deeds, it's, your, it's the flesh that's doing that. So, so your soul can't really sin. Um, the soul has sin on it before you're saved, but after you're saved, since all the sin comes from the flesh, and the flesh is circumcised from the soul, then you're not going to have any sin on your soul. If you decide to sin after you're saved, that is something that resides in your flesh, not in your soul. Okay. Um, yeah, that kind of. I think that kind of clears it up pretty good. Um, so, like you said, our fleshly mind is. So that would that be our brain that's in our body? Yeah, we have or is the that soul separate too. Well, we have. We really have two minds once we're saved. 
Colossians 2, while you're there, if you look in verse 18, uh, it talks about, your, and these are saved people here. Uh, so uh, Colossians 2.18 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. So there's your fleshly mind. 1 Corinthians 2.16 1 Corinthians 2.16 says that after we're saved, we have the mind of Christ. So I just sort of think of it as sort of like you've got your flesh and you've got your spirit and you've got a mind that would listen to the flesh, but you've also got a mind that would listen to your spirit. And so which one you listen to de depends on whether you uh, do the lust of the flesh or you walk in the spirit. But really all of that comes from if you, if you decide to do things according to the flesh, then you're using your fleshly mind. And so that's all, that's all really residing in the flesh. Uh, Romans 6, maybe that might help. Over in Romans 6, um, it says in Romans 6, Verse 3, that we're baptized into Christ's death. So we're identified with Christ's death. Verse 4 says, um, or verse 5 says, if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So your old man is your flesh. As far as God is concerned, since you've got that spiritual circumcision, the body of sins, which resides in the flesh, is now destroyed. So then you go down to verse uh, 11. It says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. But verse 11 says, Reckon ye also, and I've got in my Bible, I've circled that word also because that's important. Reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God. So if it's also, that means someone has already reckoned you like that. And that's God. God has reckoned you to be dead indeed unto sin and alive unto God. So if you use your fleshly mind to obey the lust of the flesh then you've sinned. But as far as God is concerned, you're dead to sin. So basically the sin doesn't affect you, doesn't affect you, uh, your soul. That's where that spiritual circumcision comes in. If you're dead to something, then it doesn't affect it. It doesn't affect you at all because, because you're dead to it. They can't, you know, it, it can't affect something. Something that's dead can't affect you. So as far as God is concerned, He has reckoned through the cross work of Christ, and you baptized into Christ, that he has reckoned that you are dead indeed unto sin. So you can use your fleshly mind to obey the lust of the flesh, but as far as that, God is concerned, that's spiritually circumcised. The body, the sins of the flesh, is cut off from the soul. So, so the sin will never reach your soul as far as God is concerned. Yeah, you did sin in your flesh, but it's, it's dead. It doesn't have any effect because of that spiritual circumcision. Okay. Did, did that make uh, sense yeah. or maybe not? Yeah, yeah, you, oh yeah, you, you explained it really well. I think where I keep getting hung up on is I keep, I keep associating my flesh with just my body and not like if I have, like if I have a thought I want to go see the mountains on a vacation, that's like, that's not my body, uh, my physical body saying that it wants to go to the mountains. It's actually in my mind that I'm thinking I want to do that. So that wouldn't be a, so, I, so I'm thinking, well, if that's the case, then that would be a fleshly um, thought. You know, that would be a fleshly thing because my body's not wanting to do it. It's just me and my mind wanting to do it. So I guess that makes sense. Uh, yeah. yeah, you basically, because of your sin nature and your flesh, and really the sin nature stays there and you still have your vile flesh, those work with your fleshly mind. Romans 7 talks about that. That I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. 
It was that the sin nature worked with my fleshly mind so that I said, hey, now I know that I can commit adultery and so then that's something I shouldn't do, but my fleshly mind says, well, I want to do that now. So my fleshly mind finds out what the sins are and now my fleshly mind wants to do those sins. So that's something that the, the fleshly mind is connected to that flesh. And then when you're saved, your spirit's made alive in Christ and God gives you the mind of Christ. So it's, it's basically what part that you're going to use. And if you use the fleshly mind because that's the body of the sins of the flesh, then that's been cut off. So I understand what you're saying. I mean, Jesus says in Mark 7, for example, that sin, and I'll go over there and read it to you. Mark 7, it says um, in verse 21 through 23, Mark 7, 21 through 23, it says, For from within, out of the heart of men, Proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come with, with, from within and defile the man. You're, the way you serve God isn't through doing some physical activity. It's with your mind. And same thing with sin. You don't do the sin by actually physically committing it. It's, it's when it comes from your mind. You say, you say okay. in your mind, hey, this is a good idea. Well, that's what Jesus taught in Matthew 5. You know, you've said it, you've heard it said of those of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you've committed adultery with her in your heart. So God looks at, when God looks at your condition, he's not looking at your flesh. God doesn't look on the outward appearance, he looks on the inward. So sin, by definition, is going to happen inwardly anyway. Uh, it's, you know, when I lust after a woman, then as far as the law, thou shalt not commit adultery, I've broken that law. I've committed adultery. Now, I didn't physically do it, but in my mind, I lusted after her. And so as far as God is concerned, I broke that law. So sin occurs within, with your mind. And serving God is the same way too. That's why you don't, you can't say, well, I helped out at the soup kitchen, so I serve Christ. Or I stack chairs at, at the church to help them out so I serve Christ. Because it's not an activity, it's what you did in your mind. It's, am I showing the love of Christ? Well, then that's using the mind of Christ. If it's, I'm trying to look good, well, then I'm vainly puffed up by my fleshly mind. Sin or serving God, either one, is all about inward motivation, what you're doing there. And so there is a fleshly mind connected to your flesh, and then there is the mind of Christ that's connected to your spirit. And if you use your fleshly mind, God says, well, that's part of the body of the sins of the flesh, and that's been cut off. So that doesn't, that sin does not reach your soul. Does, does that help? Okay. It's, yeah. 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 Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that was really good. Yeah, it's a hard thing, you know, and that's what I struggle with as a kid is that the church I was... I was taught that if I uh, sin once, then I lose my salvation. So it's if I have just had this one thought of hatred, you know, kids picking on me at, at school, then I, I hate that person. Well, then now I've sinned. Now I lost my salvation. You know, it's it's all it's it's an inward yeah. thing. You know, so so yeah, I don't think because like you say, well, I'm thinking of it in my mind, so that must be my soul. So now the sin is on my soul. No, it's just your mind, as far as God is concerned, sin or serving God is all inward. It's not really the outward part. It's all inward because that's what God looks at. And so you've got a fleshly mind connected to your flesh, the mind of Christ connected to your spirit, and which one you use determines if you sin or not. And if you use your fleshly mind because the body of the sins of the flesh have been cut off, then it doesn't, it doesn't reside in your soul. God says you are dead indeed unto sin. So you do the sin. The sin nature works with your fleshly mind and you do the sin as far as thinking of it in your mind. Um, but God says you're dead to that because Christ, because you're dead with Christ. You're crucified with him. So then that is all cut off. So it doesn't affect your soul. Okay. All right. Thank you. I appreciate, uh, appreciate you answering that. <laughs> Going to... Um, yeah, I know, like, uh, 
a couple of years ago, before I got into the right division, I was kind of, I hear people say, well, like you were saying er earlier today, how people in the, in the church will say, well, if, you, if you're not proven that you're saved by your works, then that means you weren't saved to begin with. So then I, I would hear that and I'd say, okay, so if I stand and if I, if I lost my salvation by something I did, then that means um, how would I get saved then, you know? Like, how, how can someone be saved if, they're, if they commit a sin and then that means they're not saved no more? Because we're, we're still going to continue to sin if we, do, if we try to get saved again. Right. So it, I, I don't see how it's possible you could get saved and then lose it, get saved again, and then get, you know, lose it again because it just doesn't make sense. So yeah. it, it used to confuse me, and then I would think, okay, so let's say I'm not saved right now. How would I get saved if I was going to like say start all over again? And I thought, okay, if I if I'm going to get saved again, what what should I do? Uh, and then I read the scripture and say, okay, trust the gospel of what Christ did. So it wasn't about me, you know. If I if I was like the end of my rope, okay, what am I going to hang on to? I'm going to hang on to the gospel and what Christ did, not what you know I do or not do, you know. Um, so that was like a kind of a turning point, and then I found right division, and it kind of put me, you know, right back to, um, you know, having assurance. And, and I'm already had assurance before, but I started doubting it. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense because I, I hear certain things and it makes me doubt. And I know I'm saved, and I had faith in the gospel to begin with. <laughs> so why would I start having faith in something else that I'm not even sure of? You know. So anyway, um, yeah, I've been listening to your teachings uh, for a while now, so I really appreciate uh, everything that you're you're doing. And now this Bible study, go back and attend this uh, from now on too. Yeah, well, we'll yeah, we'll be glad to have you. Yeah, uh, the one thing, um, and maybe this will help you. Think of it and uh, look at Saul versus David, King Saul. What he did was. There was a, a victory that God won for Israel. And God says, okay, Saul, uh, you go and uh, wait there at the temple. And Samuel, the prophet, is going to come. And so what he does is Saul goes to the temple. And Samuel doesn't come right away. And so then Saul goes ahead and he does all these sacrifices, animal sacrifices, where he's basically saying, thanking God for... Uh, for giving the victory. So then Samuel comes says, what are you doing? God told you to wait for me. You didn't wait for me. And he says, obedience is better than sacrifice. And so because you didn't obey God, then the kingdom is taken away from you. So on the outward appearance, it looked very good to Saul. Because I mean, Saul is taking animal sacrifices and um, praising God for giving him the victory. But what he was really doing is he was trusting in his own works, in his own flesh. He didn't trust in what God told him to wait for Samuel. Instead, he decided, well, I'm going to please God by bringing these sacrifices myself. So he was trying to serve God in a fleshly manner. And so because of that, God says, the kingdom is taken away from you. Then you look at David. David uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he tried to cover it up by murdering her husband. And yet God says, I'm not going to impute his sin to his account. So from a fleshly point of view, looking at it, Saul looks like a good guy because he gives sacrifices to the Lord in a temple. And David looks like he's not saved because he committed adultery and then committed murder to cover it up. But God looked at the heart and says, Saul doesn't believe me. He's just doing a religious show in the flesh. His heart is full of pride. So then he's not saved. But David believes me, but he just decided to use his fleshly mind and with the sin nature, working with his flesh, and he uh, did, did that sin. But because he believes me, he's dead to sin, so that sin doesn't count toward him, and so uh, he's still a safe person. So, may, you know, maybe that illustration helps a little bit. You know. so. Yeah, that, that helps. Thank you so much. All right, thanks, Jason. Glad, glad to have you. Okay. Um, Crystal commented 
in the chat to me. She said, well explained, Eric. And that was a great explanation. Um, I, uh, I've never heard anyone say, Eric, that we serve, the way we serve God is with our mind. Yeah. You know, with religion, I've never heard that said in that way to me. Mm. And that was so good for me to hear because I look at the outer, I look at the outer, the behavior, the do's, the don'ts, and the, the yuck of religion, and oh my gosh, it's with the heart. You know, it's with our, in our, in our mind. So thank you for, for in that detail you went in with Jason. I think it could help me open it up to everyone. Um, yeah, another good example is Abraham. God told Abraham to sacrifice Isaac on the altar. And God stopped him before he actually did it because God saw that in his heart he obeyed God in his, in, in his mind, I should say. He served God in his mind by saying, I know, I have faith that God will raise Isaac from the dead because he promised that my seed would be called in Isaac. And so I know I'm going to, by faith, sacrifice Isaac. And so God says, okay, you obeyed me in your mind, so stop, you don't have to kill him. Because the physical isn't important. You did it in your mind, and that's what counts. So. Incredible. Incredible. Um, before I go to this, Kahati, Catherine also said, yes, great explanation. So, um, Scott, do you want to say something, too? You'll just say, there you go. Uh, I just wanted a little bit of uh, uh, clarification now. The flesh and mind is not necessarily uh, some, uh, some kind of thought that just passes through your mind. It's the sin. It's the dwelling on it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's funny you should say that because that's the one thing that the, the church I grew up in would talk about. Because he'd say, well, you got all these thoughts, uh, these bad thoughts, and they'd say, well, as long as it's not really a sin until you dwell on it. Um, well, that's what I'm mean clarifying because... You know, a lot of things pass through, like even Paul said, that <clears throat> Satan tries to interfere with his prayers. And uh, so I was just wondering if just because something passes through your mind, it has absolutely nothing to do with what you're doing or thinking. But you know, it's a wrong one, and I'm just like, I'm not going to, no, no, and it goes away. You know, it's just that quick. Now, is that sin on my part? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know where something becomes a sin. I know James, there's a verse or two over there in James where it talks about that. Uh, the, the idea, I think, is that if you, like say if it's just a passing thought, it's probably not a sin, but you dwell on it, then it is. But what does that consider? Where, where, do, you pa where do you draw the line between a passing thought versus dwelling? And I, I don't really know the answer to that. Um, I would say you don't really have to worry about it because... Really, Christ has paid for all your sins, and we are dead to the law that we might live unto to God. I, through the law, am dead unto the law that I might live unto God. So, um, really, we shouldn't be worried about or focusing on when we sin or what we what we are doing as far as a sin. But our focus should be on Christ living in us, living by the faith of the Son of God. That should be our focus. And and for people who are unbelievers. Um, it doesn't really matter anyway because they're, they're sinners going to hell whether they commit one sin or one million sins. So, um, you, you know, it's not something... I don't think we really have to try to define that, you know, when something becomes a sin. I think our focus should just be on Christ living in us. You know, focusing on Christ rather than our sin. I mean, I, mean, I understand that you don't want to, you know, you don't want to sin, so you're trying to avoid sin, but really... Um, our focus should be on living by the faith of the Son of God. And if we do dwell on a thought, you know, then really don't, you know, don't really worry about it so much. Just just okay. concentrate on Christ in you. Yeah, because like lust, me, that takes dwelling on whoever the person is. I mean, you have to really be thinking about that. Well, like me, mm -hmm. I can really, really crave want and just a candy bar, a solid candy bar, but I have to resist because I'm diabetic, but I still really do want <laughs> that candy bar. But anyway, it just seems like there ought to be some forethought in your mind of, uh, of wanting it rather than just having it. But as you say, it's a moot point. Right. 
Yeah, I think the danger is if we try to define that, then we're so focused on that, we're not really focused on Christ in us. Because, you know, like I say, I go, I go to the gym. There'll be a half-naked woman that goes right in front of me. Um, did I sin and looking after her? I, I don't know. You know, what, what does it become? Do I have to look at her five seconds before I sin? Or two seconds? Or is it 10 seconds? Or, you know, I don't know. You know, when, when does it go from, from just a passing thought? You know, I wasn't even thinking about that. I was doing my workout and this person comes in front of me. When does it go from a thought to dwelling? Um, I have no idea. You know, and it's something, and I don't really have to worry about it because if I, it, the problem is if I'm trying to look at that, then I'm not looking at Christ. I'm just looking at, the sin part. And Christ has paid for those sins. So whether I sinned or not, it's irrelevant because it's all under the blood. And if I focus on, you know, I've heard it said like if a, like an alcoholic, let's say, they go to Alcoholics Anonymous, they try to go through the 12-step program, that you don't, if, you, if you're saying to yourself, not going to take a drink, not going to take a drink, not going to take a drink, well, then you're focusing on the alcohol and you're more likely to take the alcohol. But if you get your mind focused on something different, then, then you're less likely, then you, you, you don't think about it as much. And so I think if we try to define something as, is this a sin by us dwelling on it or something, then we're really focused on the sin and we're more likely to live according to our flesh rather than living, letting Christ live in us. So, so me personally, I don't worry about that stuff. If, you know, if some, a temptation comes up, then... Uh, Certainly, I try not to yield to it, but at the same time, I'm not worried about. Well, did I really yield there, or what happened? You know. So. That's a, a part of Satan's world. Yeah. Yeah, Satan is always trying to get us to focus on the My flesh. Love for Christ. Yeah. Yeah, that was another great explanation, Eric. Thank you. Um. Connie, do you have a question or comment? Connie, did you have something? Yeah. I think I'm... No, I said, uh, no thank you. It was really good. Okay. The explanation. Oh, right. You answered everything. <laughs> All right, good. Thanks, Connie. <laughs> Jerry, does anyone else have anything before we go to Jerry? Yes, that's it. Hey, Brother Brown, your turn. Okay. Great study. All right. uh, a, lot of, a lot of great input from everyone and sharing it, sharing that life has yeah. happened here tonight and people uh, encouraging other people as, uh, as we do with each other. Uh, I'm thumbing through my uh, phone. There's a... Uh, Teaching on shorewoodbiblechurch.org, click on media, then click on YouTube, and Alex did in uh, August the 3rd, was the evening teaching, he, he was uh, standing in for Richard, he was out of town or something, but he did uh, a, a 46-minute teaching, 47, on Paul's some of y'all may have seen it. Paul's thorny, T-H-O-R-N-Y problem. Ah. It covered a lot of what we talked about here tonight. If you get a chance, you guys, at, uh, take a look at it. August the 3rd. It's, it takes an uh, Oscar hit on some of it. It just goes back to Genesis 3, where the thorns started at, that, you remember that bramble bush that by mm -hmm. that, the, the bribes and the thorns that started in Genesis 3, that's spiritual, the spiritual warfare right. that continues today, as Paul talked about in the third heaven. But then you have the, the infirmities of the flesh, which the lost and the saved have that. The lost and the saved have family problems. Uh, and all the things that goes on, there's no difference. But is the uh, the great work of uh, God in Christ bringing us through that spiritual battle, the thorns, the message of Satan in Second uh, Corinthians 
twelve eight, I think it is. So a lot of that was covered here tonight, done real well. Thank you, Eric. And uh, get a chance to take a look at that the thorny uh, Paul's thorny or something. I, I was saying, you'll see it. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I don't know if he covered it, but another good one is uh, Jesus bore a crown of thorns, showing that he Eric, bore the Eric, that's good, Eric. bore the yeah, curse for us. Yeah, I didn't think of that. That's that's an excellent point. It goes all the way through the Bible. Oscar hit on it back there. The Old Testament carries right on through that thorn. Is it that the uh, the adversary with the uh, thorns in our flesh, messenger of Satan, and then we have the infirmities. All of us have that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you know sometimes. Churchianity tends to do that. They'll say, well, you know, I'm going through some kind of infirmity, you know, a sickness or something, and think, well, God, what's God trying to show me through that? And, you know, and a lot of times it's, well, that's just the sickness going around, you know. If, if COVID's going around and you got COVID, that's probably not God giving that to you to, to teach you something. It's just, it's a calm infirmity that just common demand, whether you're saved or unsaved. So that, that's good that he covered that because... Sometimes yeah. Christians try to spiritualize it and, you know, it may just be part of just the general curse of sin that happens to everybody, you know. So. Just, just living on this old planet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, very right good. The vision, right division is the only way that makes that the distinguishing of what you just mentioned from yeah. churchianity, spiritualizing, which is what they do, and then getting the sound doctrine of the fallen in the flesh uh, and where Paul is in the third heaven and the infirmities of the flesh. Yeah, only, I, I've never heard that out of right division, where they uh, get that correct, yeah. Yes. And Richard spoke about that, how he has seen that, that uh, I think it was him in the beginning. He's, he, he's growing by leaps and bounds. It's pretty neat watching and listening to Richard. does a good job. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and what he was talking about, there's, there's no, there is no religious, I'm talking about, let's just go, let's stay with the body of Christ. Just forget about everything else. Just the body of Christ. In the body of Christ, you will not find a fellowship, assembly, bless their hearts, as hard as they try. We've been there and done that. Uh, our little group back in the, uh, the New Covenant, where we had a full base sign on the highway to do covenant fellowship. We didn't, we didn't realize the distinct, distinguishing between the new covenant and the body of Christ at that time. Yeah. You know, we were trying. But uh, there's no organization in the body of Christ teaching the finality of cross, you can call it, or the what you just mentioned with uh, Jason. They distinguished. They try with all their hearts, but Cannot do it and will not do it without right division. Yeah. About the salvation uh, security. Only in right division you find that. Thank you. Yeah, you know, Paul says, Consider what I say, the Lord give the understanding in all things, Second Timothy two seven. And so if you don't rightly divide, you don't recognize the distinct ministry of Paul. And so if you don't recognize that, you're not going to get understanding in all things. So, yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Um, Eric, I wanted to let, like Maria and Jason know that a bunch of us are fixing to go now to John Forsaken's teaching that started at 9 p.m. Central Time. So I wanted to let Jason and Maria know if they want the link to that, I could email it to them. So I could, I could send them my email in the chat. Do you think I should just send that to them in case they want to email me? Yeah, I would say just go ahead and yeah, send it in the chat, and that way they can decide if they want to do that or not. Okay. I know, uh, I know, Maria's in uh, Boston. It's probably it's almost ten thirty there, so oh, it might on. be kind of late okay. for her. But I don't know her schedule. Maybe she can. I don't know. And I'm not sure where Jason is, but. Uh, okay. But yeah, it's good. It's good to let them know. Yeah, John Verstegen, um, as I if you saw the interview I did with uh, with Kevin yesterday, it's on the YouTube channel. Um, 
John Verstegen was a great influence for me to grow in the Word because he taught me that the Bible should be my final authority. That's the first teacher. I, I learned right division for years before him, but that was the first one that taught the Bible as the final authority. And so, uh, yeah, if you have the opportunity, uh, yeah, it's great to listen to John. He's got some. You, you, I grew a lot listening to him, and you know, you'll learn a lot with his with his teachings if you have that opportunity to listen. So, yeah, that would be good. All right, great. I'll send the links as we get done. So, um, Jason right. said he would he wants to join, so if he just emails okay. me, then I'll send him the link. That'll be great. All right. And, uh, all right, Eric. Well, thank you so much, brother right. Eric. We love you. I love um, you too. Thank you, everybody. Can somebody pray for Eric? I would, but I'm not a good prayer. I'm like Connie. We don't like to pray. <laughs> Don't you think? And uh, real quick, our, our money's nephew Danny may have surgery Friday to remove. They have a, he has a small marble sized mass in his frontal lobe, and they may remove it Friday. But it may be infection. They'll find out Thursday on the MRI. It may just be infection. So yeah. that's a quick update on on Danny. But yes, pray for our brother Eric. I'm about to. Father, we thank you so much for Christ and Eric. The time he spends to know you intimately, and as he said tonight, give it freely to others. Not in the wisdom of words, Father, but the but the truth of the gospel that is in your word revealed to us through the resurrected Christ, who is our life. We are so grateful for family on the Zoom call tonight. The laughter, the tears, the joy, the frustration. It's all part of growing up into the knowledge of who we are in you, Christ. That we can encourage each other and just stay focused on the Christ in us. Stay focused on the Christ in us, not our flesh. Not doing the deed to the law, but loving others through the, the ultimate lover who is Christ, who shed his blood on the cross, died for us, resurrected. So simply, the simple freedom of just saying yes, we can have life in you. Father, it is too good to be true for others, but we know it is true for them. And it's uh it is what we want to give away to others also. They would just see how wonderful, how gracious, how glorious our Father is, which is what Eric does. I see Eric's emotion when he talks about the magnificence and the gloriousness and the graciousness and the love of our Father. That gets him excited in his spirit, Father, and I can see that that's where we need to focus our thoughts. And we are so grateful that's what Eric does. And he shares it with us. And then we get to share with each other on this hour, hour and a half Zoom call. Just share our lives, good and bad, ugly or beautiful, Father. You understand who we are and that we're all continuing to grow. We're so grateful. So grateful for this body of Christ on Tuesday nights, Sunday mornings, 24-7. There's something called email and phones, and we can call each other and encourage each other in Christ. So grateful, again, Father, for what Eric has, has spent time to give to others. And we thank you for it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lenny. Appreciate it. You are, I'm in the background all the time, y'all, so don't say nothing bad about me, okay? Yeah. <laughs> he <was laughs> he said, are you having your meeting? What's that? Are you having your meeting Saturday? Oh, 